What is it about the computer that makes it become such an obsession for young guys? Well, it's the power at your fingertips. You can control all these computers from the government, from the military, from large corporations. And if you know what you're doing, you can travel through the internet at your will, with no restrictions. That's power. It's a power trip. Why is it so important? Well, everybody likes to feel in control. Under the guise of Comrade, a young prodigy named Jonathan Joseph James emerged from South Florida, destined to etch his name in the halls of cybercrime history. A mere adolescent, James was only 15 at the time of his onset of digital mischief. Evolving into the United States' first minor to be imprisoned for acts of cyber transgression, he was barely 16 at the time of his sentencing. As the summer haze of August 1999 faded into the autumn chill of October later that year, the enigmatic comrade weaved a complex web of digital intrusions. His targets were as varied as they were audacious, ranging from the telecommunication giant Bell South to the seemingly innocuous Miami-Dade school system that he attended. In June 1999, he was looking for vulnerable servers to connect by bypassing their firewalls. When he found one in Huntsville, Alabama, he went on and installed malware on it. He managed to escalate his privileges into the system and then pivoted to another 13 computers on the compromised network. The network compromise seemingly belonged to the unit NASA, the Marshall Space Flight Center located in Huntsville, Alabama. The unit has a lot of importance for NASA as it is the place where they develop and test rocket engines as well as communication systems for the International Space Station. But it was his brazen infiltration of the United States Defense Threat Reduction Agency, the DTRA, that forced him to the glaring spotlight of federal scrutiny. The DTRA, an integral component of the Department of Defense, served as the nation's watchdog, entrusted with the crucial task of identifying and analyzing threats that could jeopardize the security of the United States both within its borders and beyond. The hacking details are not completely known, but Comrade hacked into the company's servers without doing any damage. His main goal was not to profit or stealing information, but more about testing his hacking abilities on bigger targets like AT&T Bell South. This is a character trait that will be important to recognize for later in this story. Showing a boldness far surpassing his age James confessed to implanting an unsanctioned backdoor into a server nestled in Doles, Virginia. This covert portal served as his conduit to siphon over 3,000 sensitive messages, along with a multitude of usernames and passwords of unsuspecting DTRA employees. Among his digital trophies were credentials to at least 10 official military computers. In a twist that seemed more akin to science fiction than reality, it was unveiled that James had stolen the very lifeblood of the International Space Station, the source code responsible for maintaining its vital life support systems. This code watched over the temperature and humidity within the astronaut's celestial home, as confirmed by NASA. Thus unfolds the bold and daring tale of Jonathan James, the youthful comrade. An extraordinary tale of a teenage hacker whose virtual footprints stretch from the classroom in Miami to the vast expanse of outer space. Let's rewind a little bit. Robert James and Joanne Jurista moved to Miami-Dade County in 1982. A year later, they welcomed their first child into the world on December 12, 1983 in a small village called Pinecrest. His father was a computer programmer and not much is known about his mother. His interest in computers began at the age of six, where he would regularly use his father's computer to play video games. James' parents would quickly realize that their son was spending too much time in front of the computer screen and tried to impose restrictions, which eventually James bypassed using his hacking charisma from a very young age. His interests gradually changed with age. 
from playing games to learning the C language. His curiosity about computers came to light as a surprise to his father when he came home one day to see that his personal computer was converted from the Windows operating system to Linux. James installed Linux on his father's computer from curiosity to test the unfamiliar operating system and understand how it works. During his teen years, he became obsessed with computers and technology as he was spending most of his free time and day at night on his computer. At the age of 13, this led his parents to take the stronger measures and took away his computer. He ran away from home, refusing to come back until his parents returned it, insisting that programming and video games weren't affecting his grades. While this was true, later it was found that he had hacked into the network of educational institutions in the Miami-Dade County and corrected his scores in the reports. Around that time, James came up with his own hacking alias, Comrade, as he spent most of his time communicating with other hackers online and learning more about hacking day by day. After he hacked into the NASA systems, the FBI stepped in as they were informed as soon as they detected the intrusion and began tracking down this dangerous hacker. James was still in school. He would attend classes in the morning and be hacking for fun at night. Again, James went on to intercept numerous credentials of DTRA users, leading to him getting access to dozens of computers of the Department of Defense. He managed to download thousands of letters from email users working for the Pentagon. This was the first successful intrusion into the internal networks of one of the Pentagon's external units. It didn't go unnoticed. In January of 2000, Defense Department agents along with Pinecrest police then proceeded to order an arrest for James. On January 26, agents with bulletproof vests and guns raided his home and arrested him. They seized four PCs, a laptop, and one pocket computer from the house. After the news of his arrest, he became famous at his school and also made public comments to the media accusing the government of not taking security measures on their computer network seriously. He pointed out that he knew the C computer programming language like the back of his hand, tirelessly studying all day and night in order to be in a position to easily compromise unsecure systems. During the investigation, it was cleared out that James didn't run any viruses, didn't delete any files, or change passwords. He did not cause any damage in any of the compromised systems, and being only 16 years old at the time served him well on the day of the announcement of the verdict. If he were an adult, he could face at least 10 years in prison and a hefty fine. He voluntarily pleaded guilty to the two incriminated accusations, for hacking NASA and then the US Department of Defense. Adding to that, James' cooperation with the government officials on the investigation made the court to find him guilty of crimes committed by minors. James received six months of house arrest and a ban on the use of computers for entertainment purposes, only for the use of studies. The court also made him issue a written apology to NASA and the US Department of Defense for his actions. The court judges showed leniency to James by giving him only six months of house arrest, but that did not go as planned. He was soon detained by police on the streets for violating the terms of his house arrest. It was also later found from his blood work that he had been using some kind of drugs. The court went on and suspended the old sentence and replaced it with jail time for six months in a juvenile correctional center in Alabama. This was also the first time in the US that a teenager went to prison for committing a computer related crime, making the story's attention bigger all over the media and press. He told reporters that he was determined to stop hacking after he was caught as it wasn't worth the hassle and he was just doing it for fun, like it was a video game. James served the full sentence and was released after six months from the Juvenile Correction Center, avoiding the media in order to lead an ordinary life in his parents' house in Pinecrest. Sadly, the ordinary life that James wanted to live did not last long. In January 2007, the Secret Service was on the trail of an enormous cyber theft gang that was led by Albert Gonzalez, who was responsible for the massive credit card breaches. The damage was significant to the customers of the firms 
and also for the firms themselves as the hackers stole the credit card information of millions of users and used them illegally. The retail hack attacks couldn't have been more different from the youthful recreational hacking that James had once epitomized. This was a sophisticated, profit-motivated scheme. Gonzalez and at least 13 other men have been charged over the breaches of TJX, BJ's Wholesale Club, Boston Market, Barnes & Noble, Sports Authority, Forever 21, Office Max, and Dave & Buster's Restaurant. James was a friend of one of the defendants, Christopher Scott, who has since pleaded guilty. The criminal complaints filed in the U.S. District Court in Massachusetts describe an unindicted co-conspirator in the hacks who worked with Scott directly, identifying him only by the initials JJ. In 2004, the complaints say Scott and JJ parked outside of an Office Max store in Miami, accessed the store's Wi-Fi, and intercepted an unspecified number of credit and debit card Magstripe swipes, including account numbers and encrypted pins. The two allegedly provided the data to Gonzalez, who arranged with another hacker to decrypt the codes. Credit card companies later reissued some 200,000 cards, apparently in response to the Office Max breach. JJ is not linked in the complaints to any of the other intrusions in the case, but he allegedly had a mail drop open for Gonzalez. Secret Service agents raided James, his brothers, and his girlfriend's house to investigate his potential role in the credit card breaches. During the raid on his house, they found a gun and a suicide note from a previous suicide attempt. James was claiming his innocence at the time of ongoing raids. These events caused James severe depression. He was often anxious and in a depressed state following the incidents with the Secret Service again. When the publicity from his previous juvenile hacking conviction subsided, Jonathan James fell into an idleness that worried his father. His mother died of breast cancer when he was 18, leaving behind a trust that gave him the family home, which he shared with his brother. Less than two weeks after the agents raided his house, Jonathan, 24, was found dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound in his home on May 18, 2008. In a five-page suicide note, James wrote that he was innocent, but was certain federal officials would make him a scapegoat. In his note, he wrote, I have no faith in the justice system. Perhaps my actions today and this letter will send a stronger message to the public. Either way, I've lost control over this situation, and this is my only way to regain control. The note was brought forward by James's father who kept the details of his son's death quiet for over a year because of the ongoing prosecution over the retail hacks. In his letter, James seemed to think that his past fame would get him blamed for crimes that he did not commit. The feds, of course, would see me as much more appealing than Chris. If they could tie me to this case, I'd be like Mitnick times 10 to them, he wrote. Now. I honestly, honestly had nothing to do with TJX. Unfortunately, I don't picture the feds caring all too much. Read Agent Steele's guide to getting busted. The feds play dirty. Chris called me the other day. He was in jail and they let him out. That can only mean that he too is trying to pin this on me. So despite the fact that he and Albert are the most destructive, dangerous hackers the feds ever caught, They'll let them off easy because I'm a juicier target that would please the public more than two random fucks. C'est la vie. Remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's whether I win or lose. And sitting in jail for 20, 10, or even 5 years for a crime I didn't commit is not me winning. I die free. James' father remembers his son as a passionate computer geek who started playing with the family PC at the age of six and switched his own computer from Windows to Linux in middle school. Prior to the NASA raid in January 2000, Robert James and his wife would frequently battle their son over his computer use, which would stretch late into the night. Robert James chuckled when he recalls the story. So yeah, he kinda liked computers. If my son was involved in the Office Max hack, he wasn't paid. 
he showed no signs of having money. He hadn't been arrested, he hadn't been charged, he hadn't been tried, he hadn't been sentenced, his father says. I just don't know what the rush was. He later learned from his letter, James's sense of persecution appears to have been fueled by Albert Gonzalez's past. After the raid, he learned that Gonzalez had earlier been the Secret Service's key informant in Operation Firewall, a massive sting operation in which the agency used Gonzalez to infiltrate the credit card fraud forum, Shadow Crew. Albert had been working with the Fed since 2003, James wrote. That means that for five years, he had been having people like Chris hack credit cards for him while he makes money selling them over the internet and then at the same time has his buyers arrested to please the feds. When this finally backfired on him, he gave them his ace in the hole, Chris, and got off with one count of wire fraud. Talk about entrapment. In the end, the initials JJ were later connected to a man named Jim Jones, which was just an alias for Stephen Watt, who later confessed to making a packet sniffer for Albert. In retrospect, James's understanding of the case appears tragically flawed. At the time of his death, Gonzalez had indeed been charged with only one of the hacks against Dave and Busters. But prosecutors have since charged him with the others as well. Despite the Secret Service's past relationship with him, Gonzalez is currently serving his 20-year sentence at the FMC Lexington. He is scheduled for release September 9th, 2023, just a little over a month from the posting of this video. There's really no way to know for sure if James had any kind of involvement. What we do know is he was an incredibly gifted child and hacker who lost their life way too soon. As we delve deeper into the dark, mysterious world of hackers, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications to stay updated on the upcoming episodes, where we will uncover the untold stories and reveal the hidden truths behind the most enigmatic figures in the cyber realm. And remember, I am Jacoby. My crime is that of curiosity. And yeah, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought him back. Till next time.